Uh, Derek's going to be speaking to us. The official title is What are Containers and Why Are They So Important? Who here, who here uses containers in their work and or play? All right. Who here is intrigued by the concept because it's all the hot sexiness? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so you are the target market for this talk. With that, I will hand it over to Derek. Thank you very much. Uh, I am this guy, my glamour shot. And uh, some things you may know me from, uh, I worked on rack space cloud block storage, which I still work on today. I helped launch cloud block storage way back about four years, four, four years ago. Uh, another thing you may know me of from is uh, I wrote a super NES emulator um, from scratch in assembly. It was very hard, it took a very long time. <laughs> and uh, maybe, uh, maybe one day I'll be able to give that presentation as well. But today we're going to talk about containers. And uh, some people might think of this when they think of containers. My wife thinks of this when they think of containers. Um, but I think it would be useful, before we start talking about what containers are, we talk about what containers are not. And the first item on our list is Docker is not containers. Containers are not Docker. It is very confusing, especially when you see this stuff on their website that seems to imply that the Docker technology enables images and containers. While it does enable images, it doesn't necessarily enable containers. Um, so container technology, the ones that we love and use or interested in, are all provided by the Linux kernel. Everything, and, and that's not LXE. I'm not talking about LXE. <laughs> um, so not Docker. Linux kernel containers, and for the remainder of the talk, we'll talk about, when I'm talking about containers, we're talking about Linux containers. And the truth is, everything that you need to create and run containers already exists in the Linux kernel. You don't necessarily need Docker, you don't need LXC, you don't need RunC. So, no Docker. However, however, Linux containers, our, the API for Linux containers is very, very difficult to use. It's a steaming pile of poo. And no matter how much poo polish you put on this thing, it's still really difficult to use. Very flexible, very powerful, but not really useful for end users to use. And that's why we have Docker. That's why we have Rocket. That's why we have all these other container, orchest not orchestration systems, container systems. And so really, even though I wanted to call out that you don't need Docker, we mostly do like Docker. And the reason why I like to point this out is because there is a confusion. And when people try to understand what containers are, they're often confused. And I believe that the, the Linux uh, kernel developers don't get enough credit when it comes to containers. I think they should get a little bit more of the limelight than they normally do. Mostly it's just Docker. So um, I'd like you to go on a journey with me. Um, now that we know what containers are not, let's do a little deep dive into what containers actually are. And so I'd like for this session you to unlearn what you think you know about containers, what you think you might know about Docker, and let's just start at a clean slate. So I like for people to think of containers as a CH root. Imagine it's just a CH root. Um, and if you don't know what a CH root is, this diagram explains it all. Uh, but really, <laughs> CH root just provides a way to isolate processes and file systems. And that's, what it, that's pretty much what a CH root does. It's done it for 20 years, I think. I would think it was designed in the 1970s. Um, but containers are a little more than a CH root. You know, think of them as a super CH root, and I'll get to the super in a moment. Mostly the super is provided by these things, the kernel namespaces and C groups. And now there's some additional security stuff that, that is in, in the kernel that also helps secure the containers. But mostly we're talking about 
kernel namespaces. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Specifically, PID namespaces and network namespaces. So the PID namespaces in the kernel provide the process isolation. So in a normal kernel, normal operating system, you have all these processes. They can all see each other. They can all interact with each other. But if you take one of these processes and put them into its own namespace, so we're going to call this namespace one, suddenly your application, I forgot I got a pointer, suddenly your application thinks it's the only process on the system. In fact, it thinks it's PID one. Has no idea it's running on a, a system with other processes. And what this allows you to do is create tons of namespaces and put your, put your applications in it, much like, much like chroot. Very, very familiar concept. Now let's talk about net namespaces. Net namespaces or network namespaces provide network isolation. So remember process isolation isolates the processes. Network isolation provides network isolation. And what essentially it does is once you put a process into a namespace, the kernel gives that process its own interface. It's completely separate from the system's network interface. And what that allows you to do in a nutshell is network these different namespaces together. And that sounds very much like what a hypervisor does which is where the analogy of containers are like lightweight virtual machines comes from. Because the concepts are very, very, very similar. But they're not virtual machines. They're just processes that have been placed in a namespace that now have an additional interface. Uh, the major difference that I want to drive home here is that a virtual machine runs an entire operating system, it's in the entire stack. Containers just run a single process. Now you might be saying, well, we can run an entire operating system in a container, but really what you're doing when you do that is you're running init, which is the single, which is PID0 or PID1 on the kernel, and then the, it runs all of these other processes in the same namespace. So think about it when you're thinking about kernels or, or containers as containers are a single process, not an entire operating system. So is it single process or is it can be multiple Yes, so you can put Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot what we what, what's your question again? <laughs> so um, is it really a single process? So in a namespace, you can have multiple processes in the same namespace, yes, right? But uh, when you're, when you, for the concept of this talk, I want you to think about it as a single process, right? Because once you start getting into the multiple processes, you start thinking about virtual machines. I want you to think about it as a single process. You can do this, but anyway. So um, I originally had some cool demo here, but instead of trying to do that, I just copied some screenshots, and I'm going to show you guys what I did. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a practical demonstration of this actually creating a container from scratch. We're not going to use Dockerfile. We're just going to create it from scratch, um, and we are going to cheat. We're going to use Docker at the end, but I'll show you that. Uh, but essentially what this is doing here, what I'm doing here, I'm using this program called Debian Bootstrap. And what it does is it creates a Ubuntu system inside this directory. It's going to download the entire, all the packages for a base Ubuntu system and put it here. And once that's done, it says base and system installed. Yay, demo over. <laughs> and the system now lives, if we go to this var root trusty container, it looks just like a normal operating system for Ubuntu, and it is. It's the base install. I think it weighs in at about 300 and something megabytes. So you can chroot into this container. 
and install applications. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to create a container that runs Nginx and a small application I'll show you in a minute. So you chroot into that container or the actual file system. It's not quite a container yet. It's just a file system. Install Nginx. Once uh, Nginx is installed, it's all done. Uh, just as an interesting experiment, while I was still in the CH root, I ran Nginx. And I already had Nginx running on my local box. And so remember, CH roots, they only provide process isolation. They don't provide network isolation. So I had a conflict. I couldn't run it. The address was already in use because I already was running Nginx on my laptop. So we exit out of the CH root. And we go to where Nginx expects to see the uh, application files. And we untar this little application that I created called isitcasoweek.com. In San Antonio, there's this great little burger place uh, called Biff Busby's Burgers. And I think it's the first week of every month they have special queso week where you can get queso on your burger. And so all the guys at work were like, well, is it queso week? So we wrote this little app to tell us if it was queso week or not. Um, and you'll notice it has an index, and then it has its dependency file, all included. And we're just putting this into the container where Nginx expects it to be. Uh, and then there's this configuration file for Nginx. Essentially, the site's available for Nginx that says, where to find it, how to use it, how, how, how this, it's a configure, just a configuration file for Nginx. All right, so at this point, we have a file system that looks like Ubuntu, that has Nginx installed, and it has our application installed. So at this point, you could, I don't know if anybody's familiar with AppC or RunC, uh, there's the, the new application, the new runtime for, for containers, um, which at this point you could use that application to run this container. You could use Docker to run this container. You could run, use LXC to run this container. But the point I want to get across is all it is is a file system with your application and your libraries on it. That's it. So let's go ahead and run it in Docker because that's the easiest thing and most people understand that. Um, so what we do is we tar up, tar up our little file system called Trusty Container. And we do this cool little thing that Docker has, which is an import. So we cat the container file to the import and give it a name. Next, we can look in Docker images. And there it is. There's our container, our image. 260 megabytes. And here we're actually running the container. And when we run the container, all we're doing is running a single process. And we're telling uh, Nginx not to fork. So here, down here, we can see it's running. And we totally started it nine seconds ago. And then we can open up our browser. Go to the IP address, and it's not case a week. Yay, demo over. <laughs> so the thing I want you to, I want to beat into your heads again, is that if you look at the process list on this box, you'll see my, this is the process that's running on my laptop, and this is the process that's running in the container. It looks just like any other process because it essentially is. It's any other process. The only difference between this process, that's a container, quote unquote, a container, is that it has namespaces, a network namespace, a PID namespace assigned to it, um, some other namespaces assigned to it. No, this one is. Oh, is this process the child of the other process? I don't think so. This one is running on my laptop as WW data. This one's running as root. This is the one that's running in the container. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, no, it is not. Um, the, what you can do is you can spawn off an, a process, and I believe you double fork it, and it, does not, it then becomes the owner of init. And I wish I could show that there. But I believe that's owned by init, and what Docker then does is it puts that process inside the namespace. So once the process is ready to go, it'll say, hey, put, put this process into this network namespace, put this process into this PID namespace, and, all these, and set up all these wonderful little things around it. So uh, we can ask the kernel which, PID, which namespace it's in. So here we're saying for our process, uh, this one in particular, which is Nginx, Give us the namespaces for it, the PID namespace, and this is the ID for that PID namespace. And we'll note that it's different than init running on our system. These two numbers are different, so this one's running in a different namespace than that one. And that's pretty much what a container is, is, is just namespaces around a process. So when people say, oh wow, containers are really fast, and they start up really fast, yeah, they're just processes. That's really what they are. They're just processes in namespaces. So, now that we know what a container is, we may be wondering, okay, well, why is this special? Why is this awesome? Why do people, why are people going crazy over these containers? And there's several reasons why, but I'm gonna go through one, uh, which I thought was very important, mostly to the enterprise and to companies. Um, and to understand why, you have to understand where we're at now with virtual machines. Um, this is an example of a virtual machine stack, server, host operating system, hypervisor, and essentially everything from here up, well, here to there, is, could be considered a duplication of memory, CPU, wasted resources, uh, especially if these are all running Linux. If that's running Linux, and that's running Linux, and that's running Linux, you know, and all these are Linux apps, why do we need this wasted space here? So if you take the idea of containers, and you were to try to run these apps on containers, where you don't no longer have this duplication of kernel and processes and, and, and all this other TCP IP stacks that gets duplicated, and you just squish it down to one host OS. Remember, these are just processes. No virtual machines, no overhead. You get a significant savings. You can run many more apps on the same hardware as you could on a virtual machine. And when I was in Vancouver, the last OpenStack Summit, uh, I saw this slide, which blew my mind. Um, I think this guy, I think the guy who's given this presentation's name is Kit Mer Merker, Merkel, from Google. And he says exactly what that says there. Everything at Google runs in containers. Google has been running containers and recognizing and understanding these cost savings, these efficiencies for years, and they've been doing it and doing it successfully. <laughs> yes. Uh, they've been running containers before Docker even existed. Just Linux containers. Yep, yep, they've been running Linux containers, crafting them, like I said, it was before Docker even, somebody even thought of Docker, they've been doing it. That's how long they've been doing this. I think about 10 years they've been doing containerized applications. VMs inside of containers. Yes, so that's the cool part. That's the inception. Yeah, that's the inception. That's, uh, this is Google Compute Engine, which is Google's virtual machine product itself runs inside a container. Um, I believe they're using LiveVirt to run their, their virtual, virtual infrastructure, virtual machine infrastructure. 
Um, and then I went on this crazy thing where I was uh, following, I was uh, John Welks, that's John Welks down there. I was his stalker for a while. And he has a white paper about how they did this at, at Google. Uh, he's given several presentations about how they do this. And, he, and this is where he's, he's talking about how, how much efficient, how much more efficient they are at Google because they do this. And he made a startling, uh, to me it was extremely startling, uh, announcement in one of these presentations where he says that they're getting 30% more efficient use of their hardware just by using containers. And literally, if they were to move all of their current existing workloads off of containers, put them back onto virtual machines, they'd have to build an additional data center, an additional data center to, to use the same workloads. So they're saving millions, probably in the order of hundreds of millions, not in just capital, but operations, just by using containers. Huge, absolutely huge. And uh, so that's great. That's great for Google. That's great for maybe Rackspace. That's great for service providers who can see those benefits and those, those, those cost savings. But what about everybody else? So I also want to talk about a different aspect of containers and what that brings and why it's important for operations. I'm going to specifically talk about operations. Um, so I originally started in support uh, at another company, not at Rackspace. And I kind of went into operations. And then I went to development. And then I'm now a full-time developer. So I've seen a little bit of all of this stuff. And when you're in DevOps, the biggest tool you have is configuration management. Salt, Ansible, Puppet. And one of the things you do with this, um, you guys probably already know this, is one of the goals is to get infrastructure into a known state that all of your thousands of servers are all looking the same, they're all operating the same. You want to prevent infrastructure drift that they don't change for, on you and cause problems. And the holy grail of configuration management systems is self-healing. And I personally have tried to do self-healing. It's very hard to do. I did it with Salt. I don't know about Ansible. I can't speak for Puppet. But with Salt, it, it's possible. It's a lot of work. It really is. So um, I want to talk about how containers can help us achieve those same goals. So if you were to treat these container images as immutable, in other words, they don't change, all of a sudden, your infrastructure doesn't drift because they're immutable static images that you're running your applications on. So you can throw them out into your infrastructure, and you know they don't drift. One problem down. So what about infrastructure in a known state? How do we make sure? that our infrastructure and our applications, our containers, are all running in the same state, the state that we want them to run in. Well, that's when we have to talk about these things. Mesios, Kubernetes, Docker, um, and there's some others. I can't remember the name right now. So let's talk about Kubernetes, because uh, I'm really excited about Kubernetes. Um, Kubernetes is an open source orchestration system for Docker. I believe it just added support for Rocket uh, that ensures that their state matches the user's declared intentions. So you tell it, this is what I want my infrastructure to look like, and it, makes sure, it will ensure that it looks like that. Not just on the initial deploy. It also has built-in monitoring. And not just container monitoring, but also database you can do database checks, it can do socket checks, HTTP checks to make sure your application is running as you expected. Um, and it'll automatically restart crash processes. And if it thinks your application is down, it'll try to restart it. So it natively reacts to monitoring events. In a normal CMS system, you'd have to do the deploy part, probably a monitoring system that's separate. That would then have to hook back into your CMS to do the self-healing. 
Kubernetes does this natively. It's very cool. So, self-healing. Uh, one final thing that I thought was really amazing um, is that Kubernetes can talk to your load balancer. This is your load balancer. So if your application's running on these three servers, this server goes down, Kubernetes will reschedule your application to another server, but then it can tell your load balancer, hey, you moved. There's applications not here anymore. It's over there. Very cool stuff. And so your containers managed by Kubernetes, self-healing, no infrastructure drift, infrastructure known in, it is in a known state equals reliability. And this is a picture of a Google data center. And I've been told that you could turn off half of the machines in this data center and no one in operations would notice, at least on the application level, because there's so much redundancy. The reliability is just built into the, the clustering. And Well, they don't use Kubernetes, but they use something in-house called Borg that allows them to do this, recover from massive. Technically, it's, okay, so is Kubernetes a port of Borg? It's not technically a port. They've taken all the knowledge that they've learned over the 10 years running Borg. I think Borg is the third, in, uh, in, uh, third version of their clustering system. Um, and they've taken that, the knowledge they got from making that Borg, and now putting it into Kubernetes. So it's kind of like a greenfield. We're going to build this. We're going to build it right. Are they using it As far as I know, oh, are they using Kubernetes internally? Uh, as far as I know, they're not. As far as I know, they're not. Maybe one day. Um, so if we have all of this, why do we need configuration management? Why do we need Ansible? Why do we need salt? Aha, you might be saying, though, what about op the operating systems? Containers have to run on the operating systems. You have to configure the operating system before the containers can run on them, right? So this is where we talk about immutable operating systems. And some people in the industry call it immutable infrastructure. Um, and the big player is CoreOS. There's several others. But I like CoreOS because uh, Brandon Phillips and Alex both worked at Rackspace, so I kind of think of it as like, this is Rackspace's brainchild. It's probably not really, but <laughs> I like to think of it that way. Um, and what they were thinking was like, hey, if we've got these containers, why do we need anything else on the operating system? What else is needed? You know, you've got your libraries, you're supporting libraries, you're supporting configuration for the most part already in your containers. What do you need on the operating system? What if, what if the operating system was just like the hypervisor you get from VMware? So CoreOS doesn't come with a package manager. And it has this concept of immutable config files. Once you've installed the operating system, no modifications for you. It's supposed to, <laughs> it's supposed to be and if you try to, it's possible to break it, but you, you won't like the results. Um, you, can, you can modify the config files, but you won't like it. Um, and neither will CoreOS, but that, that's by design. If you need to make a radical change, you have to reinstall CoreOS. So, but really, again, why do we need to configure the OS? If our containers can contain most of the configuration, it already contains all the daemons necessary for application to run and all the libraries. There's nothing to install in the operating system anymore. It can be an immutable thing. And when I first realized this, I was Jackie Chan. I was like, what? But anybody who has deployed a Java WAR file knows that you need to configure the thing. You can create your artifacts, but you still have to configure it somehow. The artifact might be immutable. It might be the same in all environments. That doesn't mean your application is going to run in all your environments, because the configuration might be different. So CoreOS tried to solve this problem using this thing called etcd. And what it is, is a consistent distributed key store. Um, it's a clustered system, so there's no one single point of failure. 
but it allows you to put your configuration in something outside of the container, it, but still within your cluster. So you can say, when your container comes up, oh, ask Etsy for your etcd for your configuration. It downloads the configuration so it doesn't have to sit on the container. Um, and this is, this, there's, there's the blue. The blue is the containers running on the hosts. And it gets all of its configuration information from etcd. So again, why do we need configuration management? And I, I was fortunate enough to have an ex-Google operations employee working for me, or not for me, with me on the CloudBlock storage team. And he said, he told me they don't use, at least when he was there four years ago, they didn't use Ansible. They didn't use Puppet. They didn't have Salt for their, I believe they used Puppet for their desktops. But for the actual infrastructure, it was all images, containers, images, immutable operating systems, immutable containers. So I have to give credit. Uh, this guy, I met this guy in Vancouver. And uh, we, me and about 15 other guys, got into a room with this guy. And he just explained pretty much what I've explained to you, except we were in that room for like five hours just talking about this stuff, trying to understand it. And, and I don't expect everyone here to completely understand the high-level concepts, because it took me weeks, weeks after five hours in this, in the, in, locked in a room with this guy to understand half of what I, I think I understand, because I think it's still changing. It's still modifying. It's, it, the industry is still trying to understand all this. And one of the things that caught my attention uh, is if we do our job correctly, Future releases of core OS will not have SSH installed. Blew my mind. Did not understand that. I was like, how can you possibly achieve that? And later on, we, uh, we ended up going, going to get some beers, and I asked him. I said, uh, oh, yeah, that's me. That was my reaction. What? I, said, I asked him, I said, uh, what did you mean by this? And in a very Yoda-esque way, he, he didn't answer my question. He instead asked me another question. How would you design your infrastructure if you were unable to SSH into the host OS? And once you've answered that question, then you'll begin to understand why it's unnecessary to SSH into the host OS. And um, not going to pretend everybody's going to understand that because I still don't understand how that's going to work. I'm still trying to get it myself. But I'd like to share with you where I think this is going. Um, so I'd like to imagine for a moment uh, a normal, typical operating system. Typical operating system has a kernel, it has configuration, storage, and workloads. Now in the Linux, world, that means you have a Linux kernel, which manages your CPU and your memory, configuration for all of your uh, configuration needs, file system has the storage, and your workloads are processes. Now, apply that to Kubernetes. The kernel becomes Kubernetes because in a way it schedules and tells where your applications, where the CPU and the memory is available to run your application. Configuration is provided by etcd. Storage is provided by you know, some kind of storage system, iSCSI block like CloudBlock storage or file system as a service. And the workloads, the processes, are containers. So what we're really thinking about is kind of a cloud operating system. And this has some interesting, interesting, interesting attributes. Self-healing, always available. You know, you never run out of CPU power. You can scale and scale and scale. Distribute, fault tolerant. It's like taking Linux and throwing it into the cloud. Very powerful stuff. Um, the industry has started to coin this phrase, uh, or give it an acronym called Giphy, 
and it stands for Google Infrastructure for Everybody Else. And, and that's really what it is. They've been doing this for years. They've had the cloud operating system for years. They're taking that knowledge, the information they've learned, and started to share it with us. And they've given us an awesome project called Kubernetes to try and make that happen. Yes, yes. Yep. So isn't Kubernetes in the same space as Mesos was the question. And yes, it is. Um, Mesos, as far as I know, I, I don't, I'm not into the brains of the developers, so, but I believe they are a similar orchestration system. They're a container orchestration system, much like Kubernetes, much like Marathon. Uh, uh, well, Mesios Marathon is, is a con orchestration system for containers. Yeah, they, they call their thing the, the, the data center operating system. Yeah, yeah. and then Marathon uh, runs on top of Mesios that actually provides the orchestration for the containers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But uh, interestingly, I remember the slide where Google runs the, uh, their virtual machines in their container cluster. Kubernetes has just recently added support for running virtual machines within their cluster. So you could run containers and virtual machines in a Kubernetes cluster. Yeah. So um, I just wanted to end with a, like a high level idea concept of uh, you know, what do end users or enterprise users, uh, companies, individuals, what do they wanna do? If I wanna run an application in the cloud, I really don't want a bare bones server that I have to administer I have to set up users that I have to configure. All I really want is to put my application in a container, give it to a service provider, make it scale, have them worry about if it goes down, have them start it back up again. I don't wanna to have to worry about all that. And I think that's where we're going. I think that's eventually the cloud, you won't ask for infrastructure. You'll just say, here's my application, make it go. And uh, that's, that's all I have. Oh, we want to do questions. Okay, all right. I was going to get off, man. <laughs> do we... So uh, if you're already running in a cloud environment like Rackspace, where you have VMs, uh, are containers still really useful? Inside a virtual machine? Yeah. Yes. Um, so all of the self-healing properties that I was mentioning before uh, that Kubernetes provides that you could own, you know, that, that would take lots of work to get Ansible or Salt. Well, I can't say Ansible. I'll say Salt because I've only someone having, the only one I have experience with that benefit you get by running Kubernetes inside of virtual machines. Um, you don't get the efficiency bonuses because you're running in a virtual machine, but you do get the orchestration bonuses, the self-healing, the immutable infrastructure type of stuff. Um, and in fact, if you were to go to Google and uh, you can get Kubernetes on Google and that Kubernetes cluster is actually running in your own virtual machines that you're provided to you by Google. So there isn't really a, a multi-tenant Kubernetes cluster yet, but um, I'm sure it's coming. Well, the, the that okay. So he he was questioning whether that uh, the Google Container thing. Yeah, it, it does run inside a virtual machine. That's how they get, they ensure the process isolation. They make sure that there's, there's no, um, they increase security, I guess, that way, if that makes sense. Uh, here. I was just asking that Google had introduced a container as a service, so I was just curious how they ran that internally. He's saying it's inside of a VM, but I didn't know that. So my question is, this requires a whole new 
set of skills for system administrators. What's been your experience sharing this knowledge with other administrators at Rackspace and evangelizing it? And um, any tips for how you how you can ex expedite people to get up to speed with this? Uh, so the first reaction is usually denial um, because they've spent most of their operations career using SALT, building up the SALT empire or the Ansible empire. Um, and then there's, I mean, and, and, and truthfully and honestly, um, Kubernetes really does play to the cloud native applications. And there are tons of applications in IT that really don't fit or need work to fit into cloud native. Um, and some people will call that the 12 factor app. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but there's some work being done to try and get normal applications to work as 12 factor apps. Um, so there, there's, there's work being done here. Um, I, I would say to anybody who wants to start working on this is to do a proof of concept. Take your application, try and put it into Kubernetes, do a proof of concept, and if it works for your application, then that's a win. That's a huge win. And that's, that's what I'm, when I go evangelizing, that's what I'm asking for. I'm not asking you to bet the horse, you know. I'm just asking you to try it, proof of concept it, see if it works for you guys. A lot of folks still say that running a Kubernetes cluster in production is not an easy fit, maintaining it and making sure it works correctly, right? So what's the skill set needed uh, in, a say, a new IT company that doesn't have it and they're trying to pilot that? You know, it's maybe easy to do the hello world Kubernetes, but how about making sure you have a, the right infrastructure for a production grade Kubernetes type thing? Or is it easy? Maybe you've done it before, maybe you can comment. So. Yeah, I, I, can, I can only speak to my experience. Um, I'm a developer, I've done ops, I've done development, and there were some rough edges when I deployed my, my Kubernetes cluster. Um, there's a lot of automation stuff, we're getting it going, um, and there, it depends on who you ask. If you ask some people, they say, oh yeah, it's absolutely production ready, and there are people who are running Kubernetes in production, no problems, um, but there are some rough edges. You know, it's a, it's a fairly new project, um, documentation is often code. Sometimes you, ha you don't understand what this message is telling you and the only answer is to go look in the code and figure out what Kubernetes is trying to tell you. Um, so uh, if you're not ready to do that, I would caution um, using it in production, but there are people who are using it and using it successfully in production. Is Kubernetes written primarily in Go? Yes, it is Go. It is the Go language. <laughs> Hi, just to just to from experience, right? Like, like th th there is a bunch of projects out there that are using Kubernetes and Docker as a foundation for a platform. Like at Red Hat, we have a couple projects going, like Atomic, that he use Kubernetes, he use Docker, and he make it a little bit easier. And we have people running production workloads on that. And we also have another project called OpenShift, which is a pass that combines a bunch of what uh, he was saying, you know, like uh, making it friendly, making it easier, uh, scalable. So you could, run, you could run Kubernetes on your environment without having to deal with the Kubernetes part. That, that's an idea that you could get to, right? Like may, maybe exploiting what other people is doing to, to get it to work for you. And, and do it for free too, you know, like, like, like Atomic is right now is, you could just go and download Atomic and, and play with it. Uh, well, you, you're the Atomic user too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I told you to use it. Um, so uh, from my understanding uh, and from what I've done with it, uh, it's, it's kind of a, an abstraction layer for Mesios, for Kubernetes. It's saying, hey, I want to run my container in your orchestration system. And it doesn't matter which orchestration system you're using. Just say Atomic launch my container in this orchestration system and say, oh, I want to launch this container in Kubernetes and it does it. I want to launch it in Swarm and it does it. I want to launch it in Mesios and it does it. It's kind of an abstraction layer. Right, right, yeah, yeah.
Yeah, yeah, like uh, the Red Hat project. Did I miss the mark? Uh, I don't know. I thought it was just like CoreOS. It just had everything installed for you so that you could get Kubernetes up and running. Oh. <laughs> okay. Maybe that was, maybe I'm thinking of a different project then. I am. It's not Atomic. It's the Nebu, it's the one that I can't pronounce. It starts with N. That's why we were missing each other. Okay. All right. I'm, my apologies. My brain had a fart. Yeah, for what it's worth, we tried setting up Kubernetes on every operating system, and that was the easiest one for us, Project Atomic. And it's like 30 minutes, get it up and running. That's what it was. Okay. I'm very sorry. I have a total of, I, I, I owe you a beer. <laughs> Are there some best practices? From a hardware point of view, when you start thinking cloud OS, clustering, is there a best practice on the underlying infrastructure, sizes, boxes, how best to leverage? Is it better to have big boxes, small boxes? I mean, has anybody done that kind of? We're just learning it. Okay. I think, uh, you know, maybe the Kubernetes guys have a better answer for that one, but I, I, I can only, I've only messed with them on virtual machines. You know, the, I've created clusters on, on the Rackspace cloud. I've created clusters. Well, I've created clusters in our in our um, in other environments, but not really. Uh, I I really can't speak to that. Sorry. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Give Derek a big hand.